In this video, I'll offer some tips for sight singing. Sight singing develops your ability to mentally translate notation into sound. It's not about training you to be a great singer. It's about training your brain to convert from one modality to another. Singing just enables the instructor to check in on your progress. These skills are also translate to your instrument. Being able to know what something sounds like before you play it is, of course, a useful skill. Sight singing can also be understood as the reverse process of dictation during which you translate sound into notation. Again, the goal is not to have you write it down, that's simply a means to an end. The only reason you have to write it is so that we can check on your progress. The two activities are mutually reinforcing. Improving your sight singing will most likely improve your dictation and vice versa. This melody comes from the Berkowitz textbook. It's number 60 on page 17 of the 5th edition. While there's no clef in the book, I've added a treble clef and a key signature of two sharps. The first thing you should do with any sight reading melody is to observe the global parameters. That's just a fancy way of saying the information that appears at the top left of any piece of music. These parameters include the clef, key signature, time signature, and tempo marking. The clef and the key signature will help you determine what solfege syllables you'll need to use, and the time signature and tempo marking will determine the conducting pattern and the speed of the beat. Every key signature implies two possible keys, one major and one minor. To determine the key, you need to take into account not only the key signature, but other information as well. For instance, two sharps suggest D major or B minor. This melody begins and ends on D, and I don't see any A sharps, which would be the leading tone in B minor, so it's a safe bet that the melody is in D major, thus it will start and end on Do. The next thing I would recommend would be to look for the trouble spots. Trouble spots can be pitch related, or rhythm related, or a combination of both. In conjunction with the tempo marking, the difficult spots will help you determine your performance tempo. You should perform the melody at a tempo that allows you to navigate the difficulties easily. In this melody, there aren't too many tricky parts. Some leaps right at the beginning and a big leap right at the end are circled in green. I encourage you to isolate the difficult parts because if you have only a limited amount of time to prepare the melody, you should devote that time to the challenging parts. There's no reason to sing a melody from start to finish over and over again if the bulk of the melody consists of easy rhythms and pitch patterns like quarter notes and scales. I suspect this is how most of you probably practice music for your instruments, focusing on the difficult and less time on the easy. One very useful approach involves looking for what I would call step progression. Step progressions emerge when you look at the melody long range and see scales or scale fragments appear at structurally important places. I've isolated two examples here. One is circled in yellow and the other is circled in green. If I look at the notes circled in yellow, I see a long range do re mi that occurs on the downbeats of roughly every other measure. I might practice this progression by singing only those notes that I've circled. This helps me navigate the leaps in the melody with ease. Rather than thinking D to A, A to D in the first two measures, I can simply think of returning to the note that I started with. At the end of the melody, if I can keep the Re in measure 9 in my head, I can easily find the Mi in measure 11. It turns that nasty leap of a sixth into just a step. And so if I were to perform just what's circled in yellow, it would sound like this. Do, 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 Re, Re, Mi. If I look at the notes circled in green, I notice a Re, Do, T, La, Sol pattern that spans a few measures. Now this part of the melody isn't particularly difficult to sing as is, but being alert for patterns like this will help lend coherence to the melody and can offer a lifeline if you happen to get off track. If I perform just that which is circled in green, I'll skip the first few measures, it would sound like this. Re, 
do, ti, la, sol. And if I perform the yellow and green circled bits together, you can hear the background of the melody start to emerge. Do, 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 re, do, ti, la, sol, re, mi. It's also useful to break the melody up into distinct components and to rehearse each one individually. Once you have one aspect down, work in another aspect. I might start by just conducting and counting the rhythm with takanimi on my first pass or two. So, ta, ta, di, ta, 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 di, ta, ta, di, ta, 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 di, ta, di, ta, ta, di, ta, di, ta, di, ta, ta, ta. I'm going to do that a couple of times until I'm comfortable with the rhythm, uh, and you'll just have to trust that I'm conducting because you can't see me. Uh, next, I'd replace the takademi with solfege syllables, and I would speak them rather than sing them. So, do, sol, so, do, re, mi, re, do, re, mi, re, do, re, do, ti, la, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, re, do, ti, la, sol, mi, re, do. I do that a couple times. Now I'm comfortable with the rhythm, I'm comfortable with the conducting, I'm comfortable with the syllables, and then I'll go ahead and add in the pitches. This slide summarizes much of what was just presented. Look at the global parameters, clef, key signature, time signature, and tempo marking first, always. Focus your practice time on the difficult material, look for step progressions and break things into manageable parts. Perhaps the most important thing you can do is train yourself to keep Do in your head. This can act as a lifeline if you get discombobulated over the course of the melody. One good way to do this is to perform with a drone, that is you, if you have a metronome or a piano or something that you can set to play the same note over and over again, make sure every time you sing Do you come back to that. If I scroll back to this melody for a second and play with a drone. Do, sol, sol, do, re, mi, re, do, re, mi, re, do, re, do, ti, la, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, re, do, ti, la, sol, mi, re, do. And of course, you will always conduct when you're singing. A good way to practice this is to conduct along with your favorite recordings. See if you can determine the meter and pretend you're Leonard Bernstein or Ludovic Morillo or whoever you happen to like. One very important don't. Don't use songs to learn intervals. And If you've been doing this, uh, I would encourage you to break that habit. Here's why. When you use a song to learn an interval, you're le only learning that interval in one particular context. Uh, for instance, many people use Here Comes the Bride to remember a perfect fourth. Well, that's a sol do perfect fourth, but what happens when you have to sing a do fa perfect fourth? Using songs also encourages, in my opinion, a very unmusical note-to-note -note kind of singing. This is the same reason that I discourage you from writing in every solfege syllable in your textbook. If you look for long-range relationships, things like step progressions, and focus on important goal points like Do and Sol, I think the performance uh, will ultimately be much more musical. And I've tried to illustrate here what happens if you have to use these uh, songs to memorize intervals. Sometimes the syllables overlap, but here you have to sing Here Comes the Bride backwards, here's Mary Had a Little Lamb, and you have the wrong solfege syllables, and then you want to do Here Comes the Bride forward, but these uh, are two different solfege syllables, and so you can see uh, just how convoluted and complicated something like that can get.